Layla Bauer is going to talk to us about movie palaces and the history of them. Give it up for Layla Bauer. Hey, everybody. I'm Layla. Uh, I want to talk to you guys about a very brief history of 1920s movie palaces and kind of some things I found in researching that that I think we can really apply to the 2020s as we come upon that 100-year anniversary. So first of all, let's talk about a movie palace and the definition of a movie palace. What is that? Movie palaces uh, were these really ornate, over-the-top theaters that were built between the early 19-teens through to the mid-1930s in America to show silent movies. And they're really cool because of this kind of uniquely American architectural form. It's something that really originated, grew, developed, and ended here in the States. Now, they specialized in movies, but they had so much more than just silent films, because these places were built for all kinds of entertainment. So you had movies, you had organ recitals, you had vaudeville, you had jazz bands, pretty much everything on stage. And they were also very, very large. Movie palaces on the small end are only going to seat about 1,800 people, and on the large end, they're seating over 5,000. Imagine going to see a movie today with 5,000 other people. Kind of crazy. Now, they're also called movie palaces, of course, because the main design theme for these was over the top. Lots of inspiration from palaces in Europe, especially in France and in Spain. Now, let's talk about how you get to movie palaces. Now, Americans first started experiencing films and movies as like these little side show attractions at uh, vaudeville houses and in the circus, something that's kind of interesting. Films started to get a little, bit of more, a little bit longer, and people saw that there was a draw there, so they start building up Nickelodeons. And Nickelodeons were not really glamorous. They were small, they were dark, they were dirty, they were dingy. Sometimes it's just a converted storefront with a screen that's put up, one film being shown, and then maybe someone playing violin to provide some sort of an oral component to that. Who knows? So you have... The first movie palace that opened in the States here, this opened in Pennsylvania in 1905, and it's the front of a building, not movie palace, sorry, Nickelodeon. It's pretty small, and you can see the inside of it too. Not really much to talk about. It's a screen, it's some seats, it's some columns holding up the ceiling, and that's about it. But movies continued to grow in popularity, and entrepreneurs saw this, and they really wanted to capitalize that, and they wanted to be able to build these giant places where everyone could go and enjoy a film. And then you go from interiors looking like that to interiors looking like this. This is the Uptown Theater in Chicago. It's at over 5,000 people. It's one of the largest movie palaces in the United States. This is just the main lobby of it. Now, Movie palaces, at their core, are democratic. They're built for everyone. And it's really kind of awesome. I mean, these places sat thousands of people. They had movies and entertainment all day long, every day of the year. They were affordable, too. So this meant that everyone could come to a movie palace, feel like royalty, and feel like king for a day. Uh, and just have fun, escape their normal life. Average ticket cost is probably going to be about between eight and ten bucks for an evening film in today's money. That's awesome. They were also ways for people to kind of experience community. America is a nation of immigrants, and especially so in the 19-teens and 1920s. You have a lot of people coming to the States who don't speak English. But everyone can watch a silent movie and know what's going on, and everyone kind of ha can have that experience of coming together. There are places that were built for everyone, too. Different companies would actually specify that, hey, we want to allow everyone in these theaters. It doesn't matter race or religion or creed or social class. They are really built for the people, which is kind of awesome. Now, a few more of these movie palace photos. You have this. Here is the interior of another lobby of the Tivoli Theater in Chicago, which unfortunately was torn down quite a while ago. And just the exterior photo here of the Paradise, also from Chicago. You can tell I'm from Chicago, can't you? Now, one of the big companies that really kind of cultivated this idea of movie palaces and the experience of the movies as a whole was the Balabin and Katz Company. And they were based in Chicago, of course. And Balabin and Katz own dozens and dozens of movie theaters all around. And you've all seen a Balabin and Katz movie theater, even if you don't realize it. 
because that's their most famous theater, and everyone knows about the Chicago Theater. This is the interior of that theater as well. Now, Balabit and Katz let everyone into their theaters, but they wanted only the best of the best people working there, providing customer service. And they even wrote a book that they published in the mid-1920s that they would hand out to new employees that this is the front cover of, and because I'm a total nerd, I have definitely read this whole book. And one of my favorite quotes comes from this book, and I want to read it for you here. And it's a little long, because it's the 1920s and everything is lengthy in the 1920s. This quote is, Length of service alone has very little meaning. Seniority is not a great asset. You are unhampered by traditions which, although they have grown old, may not meet with present day conditions. Due to these facts, those who find themselves in the most obscure positions may, by diligent attention to the duties required of them, lift themselves to positions of greater trust and responsibility, not only in their present environment, but in other similar activities in other sections of the country. And this is awesome, and I think that this is advice that we can all kind of take with us into the 2020s, especially as how business and technology is changing today. It doesn't matter how long you've been in an industry. It doesn't matter how long you've known a new technology. It's what can you make of it? How can you make things better for yourself, for the company, and for the world around you? Thanks, everyone. It took 15 talks, 15 talks, but finally someone said cats. <laughs>